Welcome, everybody, to Season 5, Episode 1 of the weekly Quantum World Detangled. I'm joined by my friends and sponsors, Denise Ruffner from INQ. Hi, everyone. Denise Ruffner coming to you from Southern California, where it's about 100 degrees, nice and sunny. And I just did a panel for an hour and a half, so I feel like I've been talking all day, but I'm looking forward to our guests today. So, uh, Rob, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Rob Hayes. I'm CEO of Atom Computing. And since you gave the weather report, I'll do the same. I'm coming to you from stormy North Carolina. We just had a thunderstorm roll through, but it's clear at the moment. Um, and I'm pleased to be here. It's a pleasure to have you, Rob, and uh, you're a little bit of the new kid on the quantum block. So let's start by getting to know you a little bit. Uh, you're, you're in North Carolina. Is, is that your neck of the woods? Where, where did you grow up? Where, where did you go to school? Tell us a little bit about Rob. What, what do you do in your free time? Do you have family? Uh, let, let's get to know you a little bit. OK, sounds good. So I'm currently in Cary, North Carolina. I've lived here for about two years. I was on the West Coast um, for about 20 years. Um, I grew up in Atlanta and uh, my father was an industrial engineer. And he, when the PC came out in like the early eighties, he figured out how to automate um, in software what he was doing manually as a consultant in industrial engineering and started a software company. Um, so I was the kid on the block growing up that had all the PCs of all the types um, and would Kid, teach kids how to program. We'd write little games and stuff like that when I was a kid. So that was me in the 80s. Um, I studied computer engineering at Georgia Tech and um, kind of sp uh, focused on designing microprocessors uh, and how we how you would go do that. And so I figured Intel was a reasonable place to start my career coming out of college. So I moved out to California um, in the late 90s, and I thought I'd be at Intel for oh, maybe a few years, get some experience, and then go do something entrepreneurial like my father did. And um, I actually stayed 21 years. Um, the last seven of those, I was the executive in charge of the Xeon server processor roadmap. So I have a lot, a lot of uh, opportunity to work with the large cloud service providers around the world, as well as enterprise IT and other, other um, OEMs and solution providers in the computing industry. And I left about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago now, to be chief strategy officer at Lenovo, which is what brought me to North Carolina. Um, and uh, I worked in the infrastructure solutions group there, also with cloud service providers, supercomputing centers around the world. And uh, I got engaged with uh, Adam Computing about a year ago um, through a mutual friend and um, got to know Ben Bloom and Jonathan King, who are the co-founders and really was taken with the technology and the team that they built. And when they started um, looking for a CEO earlier um, this year, I uh, was the kind of rose to the top as the best candidate, I guess. So I joined the company and jumped all in uh, in July. And uh, con congratulations on that uh, new role. It is uh, still rare, but um, uh, more and more common to see uh, folks with your kind of track record and background in quantum uh, so I do have to ask that question. Why would you leave the world of um, you know, cushy C-level corner office Fortune 500 for a spooky quantum? Well, I was comfortable, I'll say. It was a, it was a good job. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I was really, uh, to be honest, like my career pathing was I was kind of planning, like, what does the end of my Fortune 500 executive life look like? Maybe three to five years out. And wanted to get into something more entrepreneurial um, and quantum computing was certainly one of the areas of interest for me and so i got engaged with atom computing with with the idea of i would kind of build a bridge to the future and didn't really foresee it coming as quickly of me you know actually jumping all in as it, as it did but once i really started to see that quantum computing is no longer like 10 years out like everybody kind of says it is for the last you know so many years and it's it's making rapid advancement at all layers of the stack, software applications, hardware, cloud services. Um, I really felt like this is a commercial business in the next three to five years of substantial size. And jumping in now um, and getting in kind of early, but with a horizon that's not too far out uh, to build a business and helping shape an industry was really exciting to me. So, you know, the short answer is it's what I wanted to spend my time on. And uh, so I jumped in. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating world. Uh, 
we'll let uh, Denise dig in those details a little bit more. I noticed two things um, uh, about you uh, when I did my uh, little bit of preparation. You said that you are um, a product person. Uh, you also said that you're a people person, but the product person stood out to me. Uh, there might be a debate if uh, quantum technologies, especially quantum computing, is ready for, for real product in the sense of enterprise technology, right? What, what does that entail for you being a product person, and, and how do you think you'll bring that to quantum? Well, I mean, most of my career path has been product management, product planning, um, those kinds of things, product marketing. So very much like what is the offering? How do you price it? How do you position it? What do you call it? Features, performance schedules, all those kinds of things. So I often approach, you know, pro problems with that in mind, like what is that offering? And when I look at quantum, we really are in a point where it was becoming a product. Now that product could be delivered as a service. It could be delivered as a machine. It could be delivered as a piece of software. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, um, I think we're at a point where customers have a good idea of some of the problems that they like to go solve that are not practical on a classical machine or cluster. And they see the kind of analog or parallel kind of computing promise of, of quantum computing being a good path to give them outcomes they either couldn't get before or a much faster time to outcome. But that's going to require them to interact with a machine that's in a kind of a familiar way. How are they going to program it? How are they going to load the data? How are they going to get it out? How are they going to access it? Um, these are all problems that have been solved already in sort of the classical computing realm and just bringing some of the just discipline of product management and service definition and all that to quantum computing to make them, you know, easy to use and performant and useful for people, I think is kind of where we are today. Um, there's still a lot of advancement in the technology that's obviously required in performance, usability, error correction, and those kinds of things that will need to come along with it. But I don't see any reason why we would delay in defining, you know, products that people are going to love at the end of the day. So you clearly have that uh, product leadership uh, people side to you. I also noticed that uh, you serve or served on two standard setting bodies and you also hold two patents, which seems to be the other side of the brain. Uh, so wh wh where did that come from? Um, I told you I studied computer engineering in college, and I, um, while I was in college, I co-opted with a engineering consulting firm doing computer network design, so data and voice network design. And when I got into Intel, I, I realized I was in an engineering role, and I realized I didn't like spending time in the lab. I really liked spending time out with customers and, and things like that. And long story short on that one, um, Intel bought a company called Level One, which was building Ethernet silicon at the time. And because I had a background in networking, I found a role in like a technical marketing, kind of customer facing role that eventually turned into product management there. And I got very engaged with the roadmap and the product definition for Ethernet, physical air devices and switches and things like that, which took me into IEEE 802.3 standards and all that. And um, it was fun. We did like thousand base T, 10 G base T, energy efficient Ethernet, a bunch of standards, um, device uh, power over Ethernet. I was on that standard early on with Cisco who wanted to put voice over IP phones into, into offices and stuff. And they needed a way to power them like your phone is over the, the Cat5 cable. So we did a bunch of stuff and I, I was kind of in a good position where I had both the technical brain and the creative brain enough to you know write some patents that read on some of those standards. and. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, but eventually, I went back into the computing side at Intel as I got back into the Xeon processor line and so forth. Well, it's great to have a new leadership voice in the quantum computing uh, community. Uh, let's find out more about your employer, Denise. So just the basics. How many qubits? How much funding? How many customers? How many employees? You know, all, all, the, all the secrets. Let's dig in. Well, you just asked all my questions. Uh, so, so Rob, kind of um, Adam Computing kind of just came to all of our attention. Um, you got your CEO role, and I think you closed your Series A funding. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, we're very sneaky and fast. Um, so, yeah, we kind of came out of stealth mode in July, uh, announcing that we closed our Series A funding. We had previously gotten um, $5 million in seed funding. And that's kind of how the company got started at the end of 2018. We started building our first system in 2019. 
uh, and, and, and then got our Series A funding, which is you know, what we're, we're living off of today. Um, we completed our first 100 qubit system earlier this year. We call it Phoenix. We came out and announced that in July when I joined. And uh, we're kind of in beta testing mode, I would say, at this point on that. It's not a, it's not a public product, but it's, you know, it's out there, it's working, and we're seeing really, um, really high quality qubits in that system. So we're very pleased with the, the fast progress that we've made in the two years we've been working at it. 100 qubits in two years is pretty amazing. Yeah. So uh, tell us what modality or how are you, how are you doing this? Um, it's a nuclear spin qubit. We're the first to make nuclear spin qubits out of optically trapped neutral atoms. And that's a mouthful. Um, but what it is, is we basically take, uh, we make a gas of these atoms in a vacuum chamber and we, we capture them with optical tweezers using lasers that we um, shine into the vacuum chamber in a, in a, a 2D array, you know, square array. <clears throat> and once we capture these atoms, we're able to excite them into uh, quantum states and write quantum gates on them and then read them out with cameras. And it's all controlled with the kind of a standard rack of servers and some RF control systems that control the lasers. So it's wirelessly controlled. Um, it's very, very small. The, um, you know, the atoms themselves, 100 qubits, sit in 40 microns by 40 microns square. Um, and there's no cables, no wires, no cryogenics. It's all operating at room temperature. So from a scalability perspective, it's very promising. And we're seeing very long coherence times because these are naturally quantum, you know, materials. They're atoms, right? They're all identical. You don't have to manufacture them. There's no imperfections. And the qubits kind of sit in them in this nuclear spin. Um, and uh, they get coherence times. We put out a, a paper on Archive a few weeks ago of 40 seconds for each atom or each qubit in there. So very long stability. That'll be a great platform on which to build error correction as we move forward. Wow, that's really exciting. It really did pop onto the scene very quickly. So that and great progress to have a device in two years. That's amazing. Um, so actually, your platform is unique right now in the industry. Um, so I think, are you having a lot of customer inquiries? Or how's that going? We are we are um, supply limited, not demand limited right now. Yes, we have a lot of, you know, the who's who of you know customers that are kind of early adopters and cloud service providers and software vendors in the ecosystem are all very eager to, to run their code on our machine. Um, right now, we've engaged with a handful of customers to run beta code, but most of the time is used for internal tuning and performance gains and getting you know getting improvements in the system. Um, we will launch a public product in the in the future, probably in 2022. Okay. And how do you see the industry evolving? I mean, this is exciting to have another modality, a lot of qubits. So how do you see the industry evolving? Well, I think we need to go faster. I think it's already accelerating um, at all levels of the stack. So we're seeing promising work in applications with end users and academia um, in lots of different um, verticals, right? So chemistry, financial services, transportation, logistics, things like that, which is very promising. We're seeing lots of activity in software developer tools, algorithms, and libraries, which is really good because that's going to make it easier for the end users. And we're seeing, like you said, a lot of progress in different um, hardware platforms that are coming out. So in addition to uh, library, software tools, applications, and all that, there's also a lot of hardware modalities and companies that are that are trying a lot of different paths. I think that's great. So Rob, how are you guys doing with hiring? We hear a lot of people saying that it's very hard to find good talent in quantum computing, uh, as well as diverse talent. And what's uh, Adam's experience and your experience with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, talent is the most important thing in driving any business or any you know deep technology area like this forward. And when I came into, you know, my experience is I, I walked into Adam you know, as an employee for the first time, July 1st, if you will. And I was really blown away by the talent of the team and the de dedication of the team and the vo high velocity mindset of the team. I mean, a really strong team um, was is there. But I also looked around and realized we have a lot of work to do on building a more diverse team. And when I say diverse, I mean gender diversity, cultural diversity, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's really important, like quantum computing is a huge paradigm shift 
that's coming. It's going to touch every industry, everyone in the world in some way, just like classical computing has for the last few decades. And if you're going to build a diversity of solutions to such a diverse set of problems, you need a diverse set of backgrounds, experiences, cultures, people, gender, all of the above in order to go do that. And so I think it's critical that we as an industry in all levels of the stack, not just hardware, not science and engineering, but also software and applications and sales and support, um, we attract a very diverse set of people into the industry. And I want to be a leader in that in my company. We're not where we need to be. We've got a lot of work to get done. Um, but I think it's extremely important or we won't get to where we want to get to at the velocity that we really need to. Um, and by the way, I'm very impressed with you, Denise, in such a short time, you've built the women in quantum uh, community. And I was looking at, you know, who's involved and how many people and it's it's quite large quite quickly. So I want to applaud you for that, because I think that's really important work. And maybe if I could ask you a question, how did you do it so quickly? Well, I have a secret weapon, and that's Andre, um, who's helped me with women in quantum. But I think it's also something that really was needed that there are just a lot of women out there that are looking for mentorship and looking for role models and are are looking to get more engaged and and get more visible and so i think it just really was something kind of the right time the right topic and uh we have a mentoring program now that's wildly successful and so we hope to continue that and just continue to grow the organization that's really good. Well, I applaud you for that. I think it's very important. Um, I would love to get more engaged personally and, and with Adam, and we would love to sponsor it moving forward. So it's really cool. Important. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, one final question before I hand you to Andre. Um, what keeps you up at night? Velocity. Velocity. Are we going fast enough? It really is. I mean, I mean, this is a race. It's a race to quantum computing at scale with error correction. You know, from a hardware company, it's as simple as that. And, um, it's going to take a, a village, right? Not just our company, but other companies and partners um, to advance the state of the art at all levels of the solution stack and with customers. And I just, um, I, I'm hopeful, like I said, I don't think it's 10 years out anymore. I think it's three to five years out to be a real commercially viable kind of technology, but I do worry we're not all going to go fast enough. Well, I love hearing you say that it's not 10 years out because for the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, it's been, everybody always, oh, that's 10 years away. It's 10 years away. So I think all of us in the industry need to change that and really let people know that it's coming and it's coming much more quickly than we ever anticipated. That's right. And it's gonna take a lot of work to get there, but that's that's exactly right. Yeah. So Andre. Thank you. And uh, Rob, your, your words uh, uh, well uh, received a few years ago, I had uh, dinner with the author, Thomas Friedman, and he said this one sentence that uh, really stuck with me uh, when he uh, mentioned that the biggest challenge we're going to see is the rate of acceleration of the speed of innovation is going to outpace everything that we know, our policy, our speed of policy, potentially our speed of thinking, um, our speed of you know implementation, uh, and, and that's going to be a big challenge. With that, let's... Uh, throw you into the midst of our famous Marcel Bruce, James Lipton, weekly Quantum World Detangled quiz. Six rapid fire questions, six rapid fired answers. Uh, if you're ready, let's get started. Go for it. Who's your favorite scientist? Ben Bloom. <laughs> Who is your favorite entrepreneur? You can say yourself. <laughs> um, I know it's controversial, but I'm really a fan of Elon Musk. What is the quality that you desire most in an entrepreneur? I think a team with diverse thoughts and really delegating and inviting that diversity of thought and challenging each other. And in a scientist, is that any different? <clears throat> no. What is it that uh, you appreciate most about working in quantum tech, having been in it for only a few weeks? Um, the opportunity to drive something that's going to make a big difference for the next 50 to 100 years. 
And what is your favorite quantum tech application? We don't just have quantum computing. We have sensing, communications, encryption, potentially time travel, teleportation uh, down <laughs> the road, if you believe in that. What, what well, is your favorite quantum tech application? I'll show you what's on my wall here. I have a time machine back there. There because, we go, the um, DeLorean. I have, bet, I have a bet with my neighbor on uh, whether time travel and teleportation will really be possible or not. So I'm, I'm quite keen to find out the answer to that question. Sticking with the theme, what is your quantum dream? Oh, a trillion dollar business. I mean, not business, but market, right? I think we can go fast. We can make this a, a huge thing and, and uh, I want to be part of it. Nightmare? Going too slow. I hate going slow. I'm a New Yorker. Imagine you wake up tomorrow and in your kitchen or office, uh, thank you to Mr. Bloom, you have a fault tolerant universal quantum computer, the first and only one in the world. You can't use it yourself. Who do you give it to? I give it to the world. I open up access to everyone for a fee. You, you, you'll have a queuing problem, but as a product <laughs> person, you'll, you'll figure that out. Who am I to do a price and we'll see who wants to pay it. <laughs> <laughs> the trillion dollar opportunity. Right. Well, Rob, it was a pleasure to uh, to get to know you and uh, Atom Computing a little better. Um, thank you, Denise and uh, INQ for supporting us. Uh, thank you, Rob, for your kind words about One Quantum. We're certainly excited to see uh, the team that you'll be uh, building and uh, the technology and products and maybe even standards that, uh, that you'll uh, uh, fuel and drive fast because going fast is very important. With that, we conclude Season 5, Episode 1 of the weekly Quantum World Detangled. You are now detangled.